My friends, protests are happening in Cuba, and this is massive. For anyone who hasn't seen what is going on, Cuba is going through its worst economic crisis in the last 30 years. Since the year 2020, Cubans have been suffering from falling wages, deteriorating public services, regular power outages, severe shortages, and a growing black market. In just the past few years, hundreds of thousands of people have fled the country. As a result of everything that has been going on, the guy that you can see behind me right here, Miguel Diaz-Canel, who is the current president of Cuba, would appear on the midday TV newscast on April 4th and would say that his government had undertaken, quote, an enormous effort to ensure the supply of food for the island's 11 million population. Because food-wise, the country is basically out. As he would say in the broadcast, quote, April and May are going to be months with better prospects. The Cuban government will continue to be committed to guaranteeing the people their levels of essential food. Which, for a number of people that are listening to this right now, that may confuse them. What do you mean the government is going to ensure them their essential levels of food? Well, as a communist nation, Cuba Cuba has, since Fidel Castro's 1959 revolution, provided its citizens with a monthly ration of basics, things such as rice, beans, sugar, cooking oil, coffee, these sorts of things. Though these deliveries have been scaled back over the years as an economic crisis has led to shortages and high prices. These shortages, combined with 10 to 20 hour long blackouts across the entire country, have prompted several hundred protesters to take the streets on March 17th and protest in and around Santiago de Cuba. In the past several weeks, these hundreds of protesters Protesters, thousands of protesters would demonstrate to make their voices heard even as the government would try to deny that there was anything wrong. The government would in turn move in very quickly in more recent days to try and defuse tension by ramping up electricity generation almost immediately, which did largely eliminate the blackouts that have plagued much of the island for months. And while protests have continued, they are not nearly to the same level that they were a month ago. But at any given moment, that has the potential to change. Because as it stands, what would happen this past Thursday, only yesterday at the time that I'm actually recording this video, April 4th, is that the Vice Minister of Foreign Trade would say on the state-run newscast of Cuba that basic food items would be guaranteed until June. Quote, we can confirm without a doubt that we have the availability of the fundamental products such as rice until the month of June, he would say. The country was also working to guarantee the supply of both wheat flour for bread production and also milk for children into June as well. Which, of course, it is good news that there is actually food that is available for people, yes, but the food program that Cuba utilizes carries a monthly price tag of something along the lines of $230 million, according to the newscast, which is something that the government at this point really cannot afford in the first place. And that, of course, is going to bring us to the question of how exactly did we get here, and who is responsible for all of this in the first place? Some who are watching what is going on are going to place the blame for this desperate situation at the door of the Cuban government and its mismanagement of the economy. Others are going to point to damage that has been caused by the long-standing U.S. economic sanctions that, to varying degrees, have been in place since 1962. The reality, though, is significantly more complicated than people give it credit for, but that pretty much is history, and that is what we try to answer here on this channel, to explain how it is that we got to where we are today. So, to understand this crisis that is going on in Cuba, we are going to have to go back and look at its history. Now, my friends, jumping into this, I am not going to go and explain literally everything when it comes to Cuban history, as that is something that is going to take far too long with way too many details, but it is important important that people understand how all of this is tied together. So going in rapid order, the history of Cuba began with the arrival of Christopher Columbus in 1492 when he sailed the ocean blue. Which yes, I'm sure that you all are familiar with the rhyme and you're probably wondering why it is that I'm going back that far because all of this is extremely important to understand the makeup of Cuba itself. Because with him and the subsequent invasion of the island by Spaniards, the native peoples that inhabited the island were very soon eliminated or died as a result of disease or the shock of conquest. What this means is that in comparison to other Latin American countries that perhaps had more mixed populations with indigenous tribes, that didn't happen to nearly the same degree in Cuba. The influence of these groups was very limited in society. Spanish culture, institutions, language, religion, all of this was absolutely dominant to the highest degree. And with time, colonial society would develop slowly after Spain would colonize the island in the 16th and 17th century. Agriculture would serve as the basis of the economy during this time, and for the first three centuries after the conquest, the island was relatively neglected. It was more of a stopping point for the Spanish fleet, which would visit the New World and then return to Spain with the mineral wealth of continental America, from the vast silver and gold mines within it. However, Cuba would awaken dramatically in the 19th century. The growth of the United States as an independent nation, the collapse of Haiti as a sugar-producing colony, Spanish protective policies, and also the ingenuity of Cuba's creep
proverbial business class would all converge in order to produce a sugar revolution on the island. In just a few years, Cuba was transformed from this sleepy, very unimportant island into a major sugar producer in the world. Slaves would arrive in increasing numbers, and large estates would squeeze out smaller ones. Sugar would supplant tobacco, agriculture, and cattle as the main occupation, and prosperity would replace poverty. You all may remember when I talked about the history of Haiti and just how important this sugar colony was for Europe and for especially France. The loss of that meant that Cuba was able to rise in power and stature, but also because of its increased importance, that meant that Spain now had to pay more attention to it and no longer neglect it. These factors would effectively delay the move towards independence in the early 19th century, while most of Latin America was breaking with Spain, Cuba would actually stay loyal. At least it would for a time. Towards the end of the 19th century, Cuban loyalty began to change, and a 10 years war against Spain would break out from 1868 to 1878, but that would fail to win Cuba its independence. A second independence war from 1895 to 1898 would follow, and as a result of increasingly strained relations between Spain and the United States, the Americans would enter the conflict in 1898. Already concerned about its economic interest on the island, as well as strategic interest in a future Panama Canal, the United States was aroused by alarmist yellow press after the USS Maine would sink in the Havana Harbor on February 15th as a result of an explosion of undetermined origin. The United States would accuse the Spanish, but the more likely answer is that the whole thing was just an accident. And from that, the United States would enter into the war and very quickly completely turn the tide. And so it was then, the same year that they would enter the war, in December of 1898 with the Treaty of Paris, that the United States would emerge as the victorious power in the Spanish-American War, thereby ensuring the expulsion of Spain and U.S. tutelage over Cuban affair. This was going to be the first of several interventions in Cuba by the United States. Fast forward a little bit of time, and on May 20th, 1902, after almost five years of U.S. military occupation, Cuba would finally launch into nationhood with relatively fewer problems than most Latin American nations. Prosperity was increasing during this time, militarism wasn't really a thing, social tensions were not major factors yet, but still, during this time, corruption, violence, and political irresponsibility were growing. Invoking the 1901 Platt Agreement, the United States would go and intervene militarily in Cuba in 1906 to 1909, 1917, and 1921. U.S. economic involvement would also weaken the growth of Cuba as a nation, and it would essentially make the island dependent upon its northern neighbor. Over the course of the next several decades, a series of U.S.-backed military rulers and brutal dictators would then rule, this being over the course of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, until the government would eventually be overthrown by one Fidel Castro. You may be familiar with him. We did a podcast episode on this guy. As the Castro regime expropriated U.S. properties and investments and began officially on April 16th, 1961 to convert Cuba into a one-party communist system, relations between the United States and Cuba would naturally deteriorate rapidly. The United States would impose an embargo on Cuba on October 19th, 1960, and it would break diplomatic relations on January 3rd, 1961. This being in response to Castro's expropriations without compensation and other provocations, such as the arrest of U.S. citizens. The failure of the CIA-sponsored invasion by Cuban exiles in April 1961, the very infamous Bay of Pigs invasion, would then allow Castro to go and destroy the entire Cuban underground and to emerge strengthened and consolidated, basking in a huge propaganda victory of having defeated the Americans. Of course, tensions between the two governments would only increase over time, and they would peak during the Cuban Missile Crisis of October of 1962, after the United States would reveal the presence of Soviet missiles in Cuba. Following the imposition of a U.S. naval blockade, the weapons were withdrawn and the missile bases dismantled, thus resolving one of the most serious international crises during the entirety of the Cold War. A U.S.-Soviet agreement that ended the Cuban Missile Crisis would also assure Cuba's protection from military attack by the United States. And that is something that I have to touch upon. There's a reason why we have gone back as far as we have, whether it was talking about the fall of Haiti and the rise of Cuba as a sugar economy, talking about the protective umbrella of the Soviets, all of this ties into why Cuba would develop the way it did and why that has been a problem. Cuba's alliance with the Soviets would provide a protective umbrella that would propel Castro onto the international scene. Cuba's support of anti-U.S. guerrilla and terrorist groups in Latin America and other countries in the developing world, along with military intervention in Africa and unrestricted Soviet weapons deliveries to Cuba, would make Castro an extremely important international contender. Cuba was effectively the communist doorstop that could put the enemies of the United States within striking distance of it. And for decades, this meant that the Soviet Union would do literally anything in its power to prop up the state to ensure its survival, regardless of its problems and inefficiencies. That is, 
until everything came to a grinding halt. The collapse of the Soviet Union and communism in the early 1990s would have a very severe effect on Cuba. Soviet economic subsidies to Cuba would end as of January 1st, 1991. And without Soviet support, Cuba was submerged in a major economic crisis. The gross national product would contract by as much as half between 1989 and 1993, as exports would fall by 79% and imports by 75%. The budget deficit of the government tripled, and the standard of living of the population would decline sharply. Interestingly enough, the Cuban government refers to the economic crisis and the horrors that would occur during that time in the 90s, as well as the austerity measures that were put in place to try and overcome it, as the, quote, special period in peacetime, which is possibly one of the most communist authoritarian government descriptions that I've ever described. But okay, how does something get that bad, you may wonder? Well, during the Cold War, the Cuban economy was heavily dependent upon subsidies from the Soviet Union something that was valued at almost $65 billion in total over the period of 1960 all the way through 1990. Mind you, when we were talking about this 30-year period, this is something that would account for approximately between 10% and 40%, depending upon what you are looking at, of the entire Cuban GDP, depending upon the varying year. And so while these absolutely massive Soviet subsidies would enable Cuba's enormous state budget in order to actually take care of its population and fuel its health, fuel its education, Fuel, it's everything. What it did not do was allow Cuba to actually develop a more advanced or sustainable economy. Described as being an export economy, the exports that the country had weren't actually economically viable, but that didn't really matter. Cuba's fundamental economic structure changed very little between 1960 and 1990. Almost everything was based on products like sugar for export. Tobacco products such as cigars and cigarettes were one of the only things that were actually manufactured on the island, and these were among Cuba's leading exports. You didn't need an industrial economy to produce these in the first place, so it never actually had to modernize or develop its industries. The Cuban economy would remain extremely inefficient and highly over-specialized in very few key areas. Areas that, like in the case of sugar, were heavily being subsidized by the Eastern Bloc countries. When you look at the entirety of Cuba's economy, subsidized sugar was basically the only thing that was keeping the economy afloat, and that is because it was being bought at way above market price by the Soviets. Which is something that I definitely need to explain here because that's a very important little detail about why all of this coincides in a horrible coincidence. Sugar, back during this time period, over the course of the 1970s to 80s, was rapidly dropping in price globally, which meant that once the Soviet Union actually collapsed and couldn't buy Cuban sugar at way above market price, that meant that the shock was going to be particularly bad. This, of course, then brings us to the beginning of the special period, as the government would call it, which the early period of this was defined by the general breakdown in transportation and agricultural sectors, fertilizer and pesticide stocks, and of course, widespread food shortages. With absolutely no fuel to speak of, waiting for a bus could take two or three hours. Power outages would last anywhere between 12 to 16 hours a day, and food consumption was cut back to 20% of what its previous level had been, and the average Cuban during this time period would lose lose about 20 pounds in weight. That brings us to actually one of the more interesting developments that I feel like I have to touch upon here. Do you see this image behind me? Yeah, that, that's a taxi. With absolutely no fuel, this meant that you couldn't really run cars. And so on top of tractors being jerry-rigged to create buses, you had horse-drawn carriages that were being modified in order to be able to create taxis. During the early years of the crisis, at least, United States law would allow for humanitarian aid in the form of food and medicine by private groups. But as time wore on, it was going to become worse. Illegal immigration became a massive growing problem. The 1994 Balsero Crisis, which was named after the makeshift rafts and other vessels that were used by thousands of Cubans to flee the country, would constitute the most significant wave of Cuban illegal immigration since the Mariel boat lift back in the 1980s. This being a time when 125 5,000 people had fled from the island. Both the United States and Cuba tried to stop this. They tried to come to an agreement that was going to limit illegal immigration, but unfortunately, what this had the consequence of doing was making alien smuggling of Cubans into the United States a very lucrative business in the same way that coyotes would operate across the southern border in Mexico. The next step of pain would occur in 1996, when the U.S. Congress would go and pass the so-called Helms-Burton Law, something that would introduce tougher rules 
for U.S. dealings with Cuba and deepening economic sanctions. The most controversial part of this law, which led to international condemnation of U.S. policy towards Cuba, involved sanctions against third-party nations, corporations, or individuals that traded with Cuba. The U.S. stance during this time period was becoming progressively more hardline against it. Nevertheless, as a result of pressure that came from varying different European countries, especially Spain, the Bush administration would continue the Clinton administration's policy of suspending a certain provision in the Helms-Burton Act, something that would allow U.S. citizens and companies to sue foreign firms that were using property that had been confiscated from them in Cuba back during the revolution in 1959. So it's not easy for them during this time. The food and product situation within the country was desperate, and in order to be able to make any of the purchases that the country would need, it would need foreign currency. In order to get this, the Cuban government was forced to contract out more and more lucrative economic and tourism deals with varying different countries across Europe and South America to try and get this currency. Additionally, with basically all imports from the outside gone, this meant that anything that was based on ores, anything that was based off steel production, any kind of manufactured product, Product, effectively ground to a halt within the country. Cuba was forced to close refineries and factories all across the nation, which in turn would eliminate millions of jobs. To call this a mere special period is a gross understatement of the highest degree of government doublethink, but it was done and said specifically because the communist government of Cuba would have really no other options in order to maintain power, even as the people started to move against them. Because as the economic situation worsened, thousands of Cubans would begin to protest in Havana on the 5th of August 1994, with many of them chanting freedom. During this protest, things would gradually start to become violent, as some protests protesters would begin to throw rocks at police. These were in turn dispersed by the police after a few hours, and this entire event is arguably the closest that the Cuban opposition could ever come actually asserting itself within the one-party communist state of Cuba. It's not exactly an entity that brokers disagreement very well. Either way, the government couldn't do nothing, and so to alleviate the economic crisis, they would introduce a few market-oriented reform. Things like including opening up more to tourism, as we talked about, allowing for some foreign investment, even allowing the U.S. dollar to be used for a time. But arguably, most importantly, they would allow for the self-employment of some 150 different occupations. And what do I mean? Well, remember, in a top-down command-style economy, there is no point in which you are working for yourself. You are working for the state. You are working for, quote, the betterment of society and the system as a whole. So there really is no such thing as a business owner. That wasn't something that you could do. You couldn't actually do anything for yourself. But by allowing some occupations to be able to oversee their own actions, these would in turn result in modest economic growth within the country as people actually had a bit of an incentive to work. As an example, liberal agricultural markets were introduced in October of 1994, in which state and private farmers could sell above quota production at free market prices, meaning that as long as they met their quota of what they were supposed to do for the state, the remaining amount could actually be sold. Which, from that whole thing, it sounds entirely like basically serfdom just with extra steps, but it's better than not being able to do anything at all. This would incentivize further production, and from that it would broaden legal consumption alternatives, which in turn would help reduce the effect of the black market. And remember how I said that the economy had basically halved over this time period? Well, the drop in GDP would eventually halt in 1994, this being when Cuba would actually report about 0.7% growth, this being followed by around 2.5% in 1995 and 7.8% in 1996. Growth was actually coming back. It would slow again in 1997 and 1998 to 2.5 and 1.2% respectively, but that is still better than it crashing completely. Living conditions by the time of 1999 would remain well below the 1989 level, but there was going to be one factor that was truly going to save the Cuban economy, at least for a time. That would be Venezuela. You all may remember when I did a video about Venezuela and its subsequent economic crisis. At the point that we're talking about, though, that has not happened yet. In the early 2000s, Castro and Chavez would strike a barter deal, something that would pull Cuba out of the depths of its crisis with a generous amount of petroleum. Cuba would essentially get access to the largest oil reserves on the planet, replacing the Soviet Union in exchange for sending doctors and coaches and intelligence advisors, military personnel, all of these different people 
people down to Venezuela. Soon after the deal was struck, Venezuela was sending Cuba about 100,000 barrels of oil a day. In exchange, Cuban doctors were setting up clinics for the poor, which was Chavez's political base, in Venezuela's most downtrodden neighborhoods. With thousands of Venezuelans now being able to travel free of charge to Havana for medical treatment from anything, whether it was cataracts, gunshot wounds, cancer, anything that you can imagine. This was going to be an amazing deal for Cuba, and with oil flowing in, Cuba was finally able to pay off a lot of its long-standing debts, and it was able to revamp the island's tourism industry. When you consider its other industries, the Workers for Oil program would generate more income than any kind of cigar, any sugar, any rum, or anything that Cuba was able to produce on its own. Cuba was no longer making products, instead the island's citizens themselves became the actual main export of the country. And as Cuban workers would return back from their jobs in Venezuela, with all of its money that it was getting from its oil exports, they would also come back carrying many different products, TVs, alcohol, any kind of item that you can imagine that was more difficult to get back home, they were able to obtain, and from this the standard of living would skyrocket in Cuba. Relations were so good that Hugo Chavez would take to proclaiming that Cuba Cuba and Venezuela were not two countries, but rather a single one. It was La Gran Patria, or the Big Homeland. Regularly, he would just pop on over to Havana for strategy sessions, or to play late-night baseball games with Castro. They were best of friends. And so it was then, that with cheap Venezuelan oil flooding Cuba, the command-style economy was, for a time, safe. Things had returned back to relative normalcy. But barely so. Because fast forward around a decade, and in 2010, Fidel Castro, in a massive move, would admit that the Cuban economy, based on the old Soviet centralized planning model, that that was something that in the modern day and age was just no longer sustainable. Instead, Cuba was going to have to push for the development of a cooperative variant of socialism, something where the state would play less of an active role in the economy. What would then follow is that Cuba was able to institute a series of reforms in 2011. And from this new system, over 400,000 Cubans would sign up to become entrepreneurs and from that work for themselves not just the government. By 2012, the government would go and list 181 official jobs that were no longer under their control. If you were a person that drove a taxi, if you were a shopkeeper, if you were a construction worker, at that point, you no longer were required to work for just the government, you could actually work for yourself. Still though, it wasn't exactly free, and workers for many positions would still need to purchase a license, like in the case of if you were a well digger or something like that. Still, that all being said, the government was going to control the majority of things in the country still. Cuba would maintain nationalized companies for the distribution of all essential services, whether that be electricity, water, etc., or when it comes to stuff that was needed for their population, such as education, healthcare, and more things like that. And that, my friends, for the next eight years, was effectively going to remain as the status quo for Cuba. Remittances from Cubans who had fled the country would be used to try and fuel economic activities at home and start businesses, and the state would struggle to stay afloat, spending the years trying to have its foreign debts forgiven. Which, yeah, the state had a lot of debts and not really much way to be able to pay them back. In the year 2011, China would forgive around $6 billion in debt that was owed to it by Cuba. In the year 2013, Mexico would go and announce that a $487 million loan would have 70% of it waived. Cuba would still have to repay the remaining $146 million, though, over the next 10 years. Back in the year 2014, before making a diplomatic visit to Cuba, Russian President Vladimir Putin would forgive over 90% of the debt that was owed to Russia. Russia by Cuba, which amounted to something like $32 billion. The remaining $3.2 billion would have to be paid over the next 10 years. And in 2015, Cuba would enter negotiations over its $11.1 .1 billion debt to 14 members of the Paris Club. In December of 2015, the parties would announce an agreement that the Paris Club would agree to forgive $8.5 billion of the $11 billion debt, mostly by waiving interest and other charges and penalties that have been accrued over two decades of not paying it in the first place. And the remaining $2.6 billion would have payments made over the next 18 years, with annual payments due by the 31st of October every single year. Anyway, you get the idea. Cuba was trying to open itself up a bit and modernize the economy. The majority of people still worked for the government, but they were trying to do something that was different as the state was trying to stay afloat. Overall, it's a pretty precarious situation, but it really shouldn't be too bad unless there's a crippling event that could potentially shut down the entire global economy. And it's not like that's gonna happen, right? Right? Yeah, you all know where this is going.
2019 and COVID-19. The first serious sign of trouble was going to be the tanking of Cuba's greatest support, Venezuela. Now that did not occur in 2019, we actually covered that before in a previous episode, but beginning in 2014 and then accelerating as time went on, Venezuela would effectively enter into economic freefall. If you want to see that video, go and check out my channel, but this in turn would spark large amounts of political unrest as well as acute shortages of all vital resources, food, medicine, electricity, everything. The resulting crisis would drive millions of people from Venezuela in search for food and better living conditions, as well as work opportunities beyond its borders. In fact, as Venezuela's economy tanked, it wasn't the Cubans coming back from Venezuela who were bearing large gifts of TVs and everything else. No, soon it was the Venezuelans who were in Cuba who were coming back home with bags of toilet paper, food, soap, and all other kinds of basic items that were gone off the store shelves. This would continue to worsen with time, and by the year 2019, Cuba was only going to receive around 50,000 barrels of oil a day from Venezuela, around half of what it did during its neighbor's boom years. This was a major loss of fuel for the nation. It's just Venezuela could not sustain the subsidized fuel any longer that it was giving to Cuba. And as the year wore on, the pandemic would begin and everything else would be shut down. By the year 2020, the economic situation in Cuba was only going to worsen. The Cuban economy would contract by a whopping 10% over the course of 2020, and within the first couple months of 2021, by 2%. Now, no singular issue was going to cause this, as a variety of different factors were going to occur simultaneously. You had less subsidized fuel that was coming from Venezuela, you had the United States, which still continued its embargo against Cuba, and sanctions that were tightened by the Trump administration, and on top of all of that, you have the pandemic itself that was working to bring the country to a grinding halt. You have to remember, as we mentioned previously in this video, that the majority of products are specifically imported to Cuba. They can't produce nearly as much of this themselves, and in order to buy those foreign products, they needed foreign currency. Tourism had brought in this desperately needed currency in order to allow them to make purchases, but the pandemic shut all of that down. Combine this with currency reforms and the entire nation would begin to rapidly suffer from inflation, with some prices of some goods soaring by over 500%. Of course, the government did not take responsibility during this time period. Instead, it would blame the crisis on the US trade embargo, as well as the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Trump administration had tightened certain sanctions against Cuba that were lifted by the Obama administration, which greatly reduced the amount of money that was able to be sent to the island by Cubans that were living in the US. The Trump establishment would also ban trade with companies that were acting on behalf of the Cuban military, Cuban intelligence, and security services, and it would also forbid Americans to travel to Cuba for educational and cultural purposes. The Biden administration would ease some of these restrictions, but not all of them, and Cuba has remained to this day on the state sponsors of terrorism list. As for why it hasn't been removed, there are a couple potential answers. After all, the outbreak of anti-government protests in the summer of 2021 and the government's repressive crackdown response that would follow would draw fierce criticism from the United States. Deteriorating economic conditions would gradually lead to reductions in Cuban standard of living. It would lead to food shortages, it would lead to shortages of other basic products, and a shortage of hard currency and persistent power outages. Promised economic reforms, which were drastically needed, were another cause of discontent alongside the embargo, and they didn't happen because the government was too busy dealing with the pandemic. And as a result of this, literally thousands of Cubans would join street protests from Havana all the way to Santiago in 2021 in the biggest anti-government demonstrations on the communist-run island in decades. Thousands would take to the streets in varying different parts of Havana, including the historic center, with shouts of, diaz Canal, step down. The government would respond to this by sending in the military, as jeeps with machine guns mounted on the back were seen throughout the capital, and police presence was drastically increased, even after most protesters had gone home by the 9 p.m. curfew that was in place because of the pandemic. And as for who was responsible for these protests? Well, diaz Canel, the current president of Cuba, the guy who heads the Communist Party, he specifically would blame the United States, which in recent years, as I said, had tightened its trade embargo on the island. He would say this in a televised speech. He would say that many protesters were sincere, but they were being manipulated by U.S. orchestrated social media campaigns and, quote, mercenaries on the ground, and warned that further provocations would not be tolerated, calling on supporters to confront these provocations. In one area of Havana, protesters would take out their anger on an empty police car, rolling it over and throwing stones at it. 
Elsewhere, they would chant repressors at the riot police. Some protesters would say that they went onto the streets to join after seeing what was happening on social media, which is a factor that is actually an increasingly important factor since the introduction of mobile internet two and a half years prior. Yeah, for anyone who's curious about the details of all this, it's like you couldn't have a mobile phone unless you worked specifically for a foreign company in Cuba until like the year 2008. And even then, the general population did not get access to any of the stuff that was actually able to spread information. The Cuban government would then respond to the demonstrations with a crackdown, making hundreds of arrests and charging at least 700 different Cubans with crimes, including sedition, theft, vandalism, and public disorder. One of the big criticisms that different organizations would give the government of Cuba during this time is that they were making arbitrary arrests en masse, noting that the demonstrators were largely peaceful, even with some of them that, as I said before, were throwing rocks and performing other provocative actions. As Amnesty International would write, quote, the authorities' default approach has been to criminalize nearly all of those who participated in the protest, including some children. Human rights groups would condemn the trials of demonstrators as lacking fairness. Cuba, for anyone who is curious, does not actually have freedom of assembly. Unauthorized public gatherings are illegal, and the government would acknowledge for the first time that trials had even occurred in January of 2022, when the public prosecutor's office would say that 172 people had already been tried and convicted. Sentences for demonstrators would then range from 4 to 30 years in jail. Of course, the Cuban government during this time would not take responsibility for any of it. It specifically would promote conspiracy theories blaming Western countries, including the United States, of being responsible for the protests all without actually providing any evidence. The Cuban government would suppress photographers and journalists that were reporting on the event, and it would shut off the internet, making it impossible for pictures and videos of the protest and violence against protesters to be shared on social media until significantly later. And while that is definitely bad, these protests would effectively set the tone for how things were going to go for the next three years in Cuba. Because things would only get worse. And as the economic situation further declined, it would be on February 28th of this year, of 2024, that it was announced for the first time in history that the Cuban communist regime would request humanitarian aid from the United Nations, specifically from the UN World Food Program. This being due to the impossibility of distributing subsidized milk to children under the age of seven. The UN agency would confirm that they had received an official request from the government of the Republic of Cuba and that supplies of milk had already been sent to the Caribbean island. The WFP would recognize the, quote, urgent need in Cuba's request due to the deep economic crisis that Cuba was facing, which would significantly affect the food and food security of the entire population. The Cuban government would then go on to announce that it was not able to actually guarantee the supply of subsidized bread, something that was included in the basket of basic foodstuffs that was co-financed by the government until the end of March of this year due to a lack of wheat flour. It is true that Cuba has suffered from shortages for the last several decades, but so far it has somehow managed to work even in some of the most difficult times. Now though, it looks as though the system is completely cracking. Because look, the reality of the situation is that considering everything we have talked about, everything we know about Cuba, when the government in Havana goes and admits the lack of basic foodstuffs on things such as milk and bread and publicly asks for international human humanitarian aid, that is a prime indicator that the economic crisis is significantly worse than most people anticipated, and the communist regime is suffering. At any given point, it could potentially collapse. It is desperate. And when we are talking about this, the current food shortages are most certainly the result of poor management. If you go and look at bread production as only one factor, of the five mills that are on the island, the things that will actually grind wheat, the things that will make flour, the things that will help to produce bread, only a single single one is operational, and even that one operational mill is producing far below the demand. In fact, we know that management is one of the key factors of this entire problem because over the course of January, the Russian government would end up donating large amounts of wheat, 25,000 tons of it, which theoretically past that point would be able to cover the island's needs for food for more than a month. And yet still, despite this happening, the shortage was still present. This leads us to the question of how the donated wheat was even being used in the first place. Furthermore, efforts by the Cuban government to try and replace bread with alternatives such as cassava, rice, squash, and other things have simply not worked. It hasn't been enough. It's only met around 
around 15% of the demand that has been needed. Attempts to secure imported flour through non-state channels would also not work, as only 3,000 tons of flour were provided per month, which was insufficient to meet the needs of the population. Of course, the response from the government during this time was going to be to blame the United States and its sanctions for the bread shortages. But at the same time that these shortages are happening, the government of Cuba was simultaneously pumping massive amounts of foreign currency revenues into the construction of luxury resorts and hotels for tourists, all in an effort to try and stimulate tourism again and bring back the economy for Cuba. You know, instead of feeding its people. Of course, people are going to then wonder why things have gotten so bad in recent months. And in late December of 2023, the Cuban government had announced a series of measures, including hikes in fuel and public transportation prices, things that would be an attempt to try and reduce its widening fiscal deficit. The government simply couldn't pay for things anymore, and yet critics would attack these new policies as generators of inflation, enacted at the wrong time without incentives to actually help domestic production along. But no, Cuba was doing quite literally anything that it could to try and stay afloat, and the ministers within the government seemingly did not know what to do at all, with the government in turn trying to find scapegoats in order to blame for the current crisis. At the beginning of February, the economy minister, Alejandro Gill, was dismissed, and subsequently it was announced that he was being investigated for corruption. Along with Gill, some other officials were also removed from their position, such as the food industry minister, Manuel Santiago Sobrino Martinez, and science minister, Elba Rosa Perez Montoya. Although no one had predicted that these layoffs were going to happen in the first place, at the beginning of the year, Raul Castro had called upon all leaders who were not achieving results to leave their position, saying, and I quote, those who, due to insufficient capacity, lack of preparation, or simply because they are tired, are not up to the job, must leave their jobs to another comrade who is willing to take on the task. The firing of Gill and others is an attempt by Diaz-Canel and also Raul Castro to try and shift responsibility to the ministers who did everything under their control. After all, in a one-party state, you cannot blame the party. Subsequently moving into this previous month, the communist government would decide to implement the previously announced increase in price of electricity for large users on March 1st. But they would decide to postpone the increase in price of liquefied gas for small consumers, which is widely used on the island for cooking. Government officials would reveal that they had decided to limit the March 1st fuel price hike to the retail sector, leaving unchanged wholesale prices applied to public services, such as transport, in order to try and soften the blow to consumers. But, even if it softened the blow a little bit, it was still a blow. And things were going to reach a boiling point. And on March 17th of 2024, full-scale protests would break out in Santiago, Cuba's second largest city. In fact, the protests got so bad, it was so embarrassing, that Cuba's foreign ministry on March 18th would say that it summoned the top U.S. diplomat on the island to a meeting and accused the United States of seeking to stoke a broader anti-government uprising and of meddling in Cuba's internal affairs. Rallies in protest of oppressive hours-long black... Rallies in protest of the blackouts, of food shortages, of everything that has been going on would erupt in at least five locations on the island on the 17th. The U.S. government would in turn respond to all this on X, formerly Twitter, saying that it was monitoring the protest and encouraged the Cuban government to respect the human rights of the protesters and address the legitimate needs of the Cuban people. Those comments would in turn prompt Cuba's foreign ministry to call upon Benjamin Ziff, the U.S. representative, to a meeting with Deputy Foreign Minister Carlos Fernandez de Cosa who, quote, formally conveyed his firm rejection of the government's interventionist behavior and slanderous messages. A U.S. State Department spokesman would say that it was absurd to suggest that Washington was behind protests, as literally no proof was offered whatsoever. Cuba's state-run newscast would then respond to this by showing posts from social media, including some from U.S. members of Congress about the demonstrations, and accused U.S.-based agitators of trying to confuse the situation or stoke anger by suggesting government repression or more widespread protest than was actually the case. The president of Cuba himself would also point a finger at Washington, saying, quote, mediocre politicians and networked terrorists lined up from South Florida to heat up the streets of Cuba with interventionist messages and calls for chaos. They were left wanting. This all being from a statement that he would say on X. Still, despite the strong statement, the government of Cuba would in turn state that it did expect blackouts to remain acute throughout the week, with electricity generation meeting only around two-thirds of demand. The protests themselves would continue even to this day, despite the fact that Russia is now sending in massive amounts of oil to try and relieve the beleaguered country. Which brings us to the big question of, well, what next?
The reality of all of this is that although the communist regime is most certainly endangered, it's not exactly going to be easy to carry out an Arab Spring style revolution. That's not something that is just going to spontaneously happen. The main reason is that the regime's repressive apparatus is still very much alive and well. A dense state intelligence network has entwined local institutions and civil society, and there is the constant threat of long prison sentences for political activism. These are all factors that make it very difficult for any Cubans that do not like the government to organize politically. And that, in turn, is why historically, the majority of people, rather than fighting to try and reform the government, have instead opted to leave the country. So while no changes are set to immediately happen, if the economic situation continues to collapse, the repressive apparatus of the Cuban state may not actually be enough to preserve the regime, because elements of the ruling structures will sooner or later be more seriously affected by the crisis. And already as it stands, they are. Empty shelves, shortages of medicine and fuel, all of these things are what drove the anti-communist movements in Eastern Europe back in the late 1980s and 90s. All of this is happening currently, and if it reaches a fever pitch, who can really say what is going to happen? Despite the crisis, the regime is not something that is going to dissolve voluntarily, and reaching the point of collapse is still possible, because in the end, no one is capable of eating ideology. They need food something that the government has been failing to deliver. And the government of Cuba knows that. They've been forced to tread more lightly in the face of increased social media presence of protesters. They can try as much as they want to blame the United States or other outside factors, but in the end, one wrong move, and actions are going to be exposed to the entire world just like in 2021. So instead, the government is desperately trying to come up with more food and fuel. The question is, at this point, can it? We will see. My friends, this has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. I want to thank you all very much for watching and joining me here today. I know this has been probably a very long video, and I appreciate all of you who have stuck with me during this time. If you could, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should cover next. There is a lot of things that are going on here, and if you want an analysis of any other events and context and history behind them, let me know. My friends, thank you very much. I will see you next time, and goodbye.